very warm welcome to all of you. My name is Samreen Bori and I'm a part of the Fiki Arise team. On behalf of Fiki Arise, I would like to thank all of you for joining us today in the sixth webinar of the Fiki Arise Higher Webinar Series for Remote Schooling, Teaching for the New Normal. And without further ado, let's start with the webinar proceedings. I would like to welcome Mr. Shishir Jaipuria, co-chair Fiki Arise, and Chairman Seit Anandram Jaipuria Group of Educational Institutions. Friends, the Seit Anandram Jaipuria Group of Educational Institutions has been active in the field of education for the last 75 years, making a humble beginning in 1945 by starting an undergraduate college in Calcutta. Presently, the group operates in all the verticals of education landscape and runs five preschools, 12 K to 12 schools, and two management institutions. I would now request Mr. Jaipuria to open the webinar. Over to you, sir. Namaskar. Good afternoon. And a very warm welcome to the sixth webinar organized by Piki Arise. Most of us know that Piki is an apex chamber which represents the interest of the Indian industry and trade. It mobilizes consensus amongst various stakeholders for policy advocacy and sharing of best practices. It was established in the year 1927 at the inspiration of none other than the father of the nation, Sri Mahatma Gandhi. Fikki has been active in various verticals of education, namely higher education and vocational education for over a decade. We have witnessed a manifold growth of self-financed independent schools in India, which today caters to over 43% of the school-going children. A need arose for policy advocacy as well as defining norms and standards for this sector. Picky Arise came into existence four years back and has been actively engaging both with the central and state government authorities. ARISE stands for an Alliance for Reimagining School Education. Friends, COVID-19 has, has disrupted the manufacturing and service sectors all across the globe. Education sector is no exception. In India, we presently are in a lockdown for the eighth consecutive week. Like all other sectors, the education sector was also caught unaware. However, the teaching community embraced the challenge and moved from classroom teaching to online teaching in a seamless manner. Thanks to the grit, the passion and the perseverance of our teachers, that teaching continued despite schools being closed. The whole landscape of education was transformed by teachers using digital tools and creative approaches. They are undoubtedly our Corona heroes. The webinar series has had an overwhelming response. I'm delighted to share that the outreach to the educators has been in 623 cities, 47 countries, with close to 100,000 viewers on various platforms so far. It clearly demonstrates the eagerness of the education community to transform and move forward with agility to adapt to the new learning. I would like to welcome Pallavi, founder of Hire, who is our knowledge partner for the webinar series. She will be moderating the session. Pallavi is an education policy specialist, having worked with the United Nations and Government of India and has trained teachers across curriculums. I would also like to welcome our esteemed panelists who have been sharing, who will be sharing their views on the online assessment today. Over to you, Pallavi. Thank you very much, Mr. Jaipuria, for that introduction. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome 
on behalf of Haya to today's webinar. My name is Pallavi Devedi and I'm the founder of Haya. Haya is a teacher professional development and evaluation company and we work with schools and educators around the world to ensure that quality teaching reaches every classroom. I'd like to thank Vicky Arise for bringing us on board this exciting initiative to connect educators and to share classroom ideas that have worked from schools around the world. Today, we're gonna to be talking about student assessments for primary school. We will ideate in today's session on how to check for understanding online, how to keep a track of student progress, what educators need to keep in mind when they're designing assessments, We'll explore strategies that meet different assessment needs, as well as some of the interesting online tools that can be used to achieve these assessment goals. Um, I wanted to share with all of you that today's session's recording will be emailed to every participant, and that we'll also be sending out a resource bank uh, with all the resources that have been shared by today's panelists in the form of a Padlet, and both of these will be emailed to everyone. I'm delighted to be sharing this space today with four absolutely innovative educators and education professionals. Um, I'd like to welcome first Dr. Nick Seville. Uh, Dr. Nick is the Director, Research and Thought Leadership for Cambridge Assessment English. Um, we also have with us today Ms. Ramanjit Guman. Uh, Ms. Guman is the Principal of Oak Ridge International School in Mohali. We also have with us all the way bright and early from um, Michigan, Detroit, Mr. Patrick Harris. Patrick is an elementary school educator at the Detroit Achievement Academy. Also joining us is Ms. Spriti Mutneja. Uh, Ms. Spriti is the primary school faculty at the Delhi Public Schools, Cyberbad. So that's all of our panelists for today. And without further ado, I'd like to get started with today's discussions. Um, I'll start very quickly by sharing my screen. Uh, and setting the agenda for, uh, for our discussions today. And here goes. So when we're thinking about designing online assessments, um, what we want to focus on is ways in which we can look at checking for student understanding and ways in which we can actually help students achieve their learning goals. So with that in mind, I wanted to start by by thinking about assessments slightly differently than we, we, we probably were thinking about them uh, in our brick and mortar classrooms. Uh, because online platforms have actually made it a lot easier in very many interesting ways to actually think of assessments as windows, as windows into what your student knows, into what they might like to do better, into ways in which we can support them in achieving these learning gaps uh, and give them targeted feedback to achieve their goals. So assessments should then be viewed as windows and not really as doors or as milestones that students need to, be, uh, need to cross. Um, and with that um, in mind, uh, we will be talking in today's session about the role of assessments, how we would assess our students the importance of giving feedback uh, for assessments as well as tracking student progress. So I'd like to get started by, by talking a little bit about the role and the uses of assessments. Um, we're all familiar with each of these three um, assessment um, uses uh, that are on the screen uh, in front of you. Uh, the first being a diagnostic purpose where we're able to evaluate students before we introduce a new knowledge or a new skill set, um, as well as a, a follow up in many ways of, of what they've learned in previous grades as well. We're also looking at assessments today uh, in their formative role being extremely crucial um, to be conducted at various periodic intervals to understand how much has the student really understood of what you have delivered uh, in terms of a new content or a new skill um, and identify these areas or these skill gaps, uh, both in terms of the student's strength as well as their weaknesses and help them then recalibrate their goals and their learning to achieve, uh, to achieve a more enhanced understanding. Uh, and finally, of course, we, uh, we think of assessments in their summative role uh, where we evaluate students for specific skill sets um, that are measured against um, end of year benchmarks or criteria that are, that are defined perhaps by the curriculum or by your school. Um, and each of these 
uh, different roles of assessment uh, is what all of our panelists today will be talking about in different ways. Um, and I also wanted to, um, to, to alert you to, um, to when we look at uh, these different roles of assessments, we're actually looking at assessments with learning being at the center of assessments as opposed to grades. So when we conduct any of these kinds of assessment um, activities in our classrooms, we're largely looking at assessment for learning, assessment as learning, and assessment of learning. What do I really mean by each of these three types of roles of assessments? What do I mean when I say assessment for learning? Assessment for learning is real-time diagnostic uh, assessment, where I'm able to provide my student with an immediate feedback on what they need to be able to understand, um, what they've not been able to gather, what they've not been able to, um, to, to exhibit to me that they know, uh, and also help them track along a learning continuum where they are right now and where they need to get to. Um, also, we look at assessment as learning. How do we get our students to develop these metacognitive ways um, of learning more about their learning and how much they know? How do we get our students to assess where they are themselves and track their own goals, measure their own progress, give each other feedback in the process as well? And finally, of course, we look at assessment of learning where we're looking at summative um, end of unit or um, end of year tasks also perhaps in some cases. Um, and this is where we get students to, to measure where they are in terms of learning outcomes for their grade level or for that entire unit for that matter. And it's really crucial that we understand that each of these roles of assessments don't operate in isolation, that they're all connected to one another where all of them are essentially functioning to help the student learn better and to empower us in the process to assist that learning. So a lot of this is to do with uh, the way in which you can actually uh, support students to learn better as opposed to give them a grade or measure their learning in some ways and keep it simply at that. So uh, a lot of what we're going to be talking about today is largely going to keep uh, learning at the heart of, um, uh, of assessments and uh, a very crucial part also of assessments being feedback. An assessment is pointless unless it's telling the student how they can do better or what they did really well. So timely assessment as, uh, feedback is really crucial. Goal-directed feedback. Um, where am I right now as a student in this grade? Where do I need to get? What am I supposed to do to actually get there? Um, Feedback being descriptive and ongoing is extremely crucial as well. Um, giving very, very specific pointed feedback to the student um, not only helps them get a better sense of um, where they faltered, uh, but also gives them a lot of more confidence in terms of what they did well. And this also encourages self-reflection in many ways. But what is the most important part of feedback is that it's actually a collaborative process between the teacher and the student, where you're not simply directing the student or announcing to the student where they are, but you're also helping the student be able to question what it is that you told them and what it is that uh, you're, you're advising them on. So all of these different aspects of feedback, all of our educators uh, on the panel today are going to be talking about. Um, and two tools that we wanted to recommend, uh, one was um, for, for promoting student-led feedback was Floop, and the other one for those of you who find it very difficult to give feedback on, on PDFs that are being scanned and sent to you, uh, you can use Kaizena to actually give voice recorded feedback. Works particularly well for uh, the age group of primary school students. So with that, um, I'd like to, uh, to, um, to bring forth our first speaker and have them talk a little bit about assessments from their standpoint. Uh, and I'd like to invite um, Dr. Nick uh, to talk a little bit about uh, the role and function of assessments and what his views on, um, on learning-centered assessments really are. So over to you, Dr. Nick. Okay, um, greetings everybody. I hope you can hear me. Um, from a very sunny Cambridge morning. So it's morning here. Uh, good afternoon to you all. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be here. So thank you very much for the um, introduction. So I'm, I'm approaching this from a, a professional in language assessment, English language assessment, but I'm talking about something today which I'm calling the ecosystem of learning. 
which I think ties in very well to the very useful scene setter from Pallavi. Uh, particularly her idea that assessment becomes win a window which sheds light on things, which lets the air in, as it were. Uh, I can see the very um, beautiful sunshine out of my window today, which is coming in on me. Um, I'd just like to introduce you to a few key concepts which are at the heart of my talk. One is the, and central, is the idea of learning-oriented assessment, which is integrating learning and assessment, which is about personalized and socially uh, relevant learning. I thought I'd just get this out of my screen. Um, particularly now the role of digital technology. And of course, we have to bear in mind um, how we maintain ethical and fair treatment for all as we move into a, a world um, of the new normal, particularly in designing online assessments. Uh, things like access and availability of technology come to mind. So a key, a key concept in an ecosystem approach is collaboration and how we work together across the learning landscape to address the current challenge of what you might call at-home education, to take advantage of this, not simply to, to catch up, to recover, but to reimagine and, and to think about how we could do things differently, but also potentially better in future. And I've been writing about this for a while. In fact, I did a presentation uh, at a conference organized with Tiki about four years ago in India where I introduced the idea of ecosystem thinking. And we're all familiar with ecosystem. Immediately you think about a landscape with animals and trees and plants which live together in harmony of some kind. We've been taking this idea into education. It's not new, but I've been focusing on it particularly uh, for English language education because it provides a coherent and comprehensive approach that prioritizes learning. And that means that all forms of assessment of the kind we've heard about in Palavi contribute to learning. And if used properly, can help raise standards. And in, in my case, it will be standards of English language proficiency. The aim is to bring together large scale assessments, such as exams and external tests, into a systemic relationship with teaching and all types of assessment that occur in learning contexts. And in primary school, that is mainly teacher-based, school-based assessments of the kind that you're all familiar with. But the ecosystem seeks to connect what goes on in classrooms, the traditional classroom, which, which goes on outside to extend the learning beyond the walls of the classroom. This has become a reality. Uh, I was promoting it as a good idea before, but I think it's something which we're talking about as the new normal. Uh, around the world, these are the landscapes which we're familiar with. Uh, but in the bottom corner, you see that even in traditional classrooms, we're getting to move into a way of learning which has a device of some kind in it. And what becomes essential in thinking about learning, particularly in an ecosystem model, is putting the learner at the center of our ecosystem. So it becomes learner-centered by definition. And we're thinking about how we help that learner as an individual, every step of the way from a, uh, a toddler, uh, a primary school child, to becoming a doctor, a nurse, or, or some profession later in life where the same kind of skills will be needed and learning will need to continue, for example, in perfecting your English language ability. So LOA, or Learning Oriented Assessment, integrates learning and assessment by design with a view to achieving the positive impact that we heard about from Palavi. It puts the learning task at the center and ultimately it's the feedback based on evidence of observation or through tests, which drives the learning and seeks to um, demonstrate progression. And it, it has the learner connected with society because ultimately it's the things we need to do in society which the school has to uh, be accountable for. So in this LOA diagram we have the learner and the skills needed in the macro context of society joined up by education, the school, the curriculum, the syllabus, the content and the construct, the ideas of things that we, we need to assess and feedback on which have to be integrated in some central way. 
And this is uh, written about in, in the book I've done with Neil Jones on LOA, we call it a systemic approach. So this diagram is at the heart of what I'm talking about. You might like to reflect on it later. It, in, in language education, it drives an iterative cycle which, which profiles the learner on the bottom left-hand corner and allows that learner to reach societally valued learning objectives as perhaps indicated by a frame of reference like a sufficiency scale on the, on the right there, that's the CEFR, Common European Framework of Reference. What we're seeing now and what I've been advocating for a while is that in order to drive this ecosystem approach, we need to take advantage of the change that's happened in our society, the industrial revolution that connects us all together through data and devices. Uh, and this is the uh, at home model that we're seeing. So issues like availability of the technology, the connectivity through internet, how the data is collected, whether that's ethical and so forth, become part of the, of the issue. So first thing is we must make sure our connections are strong, technically. That's a role for government and, and policymakers. Then we can seek to take advantage of this to build our ecosystems uh, of learning, which extend learning beyond the classroom, and then allow us to focus on the things that we know support learning, greater autonomy, the ability to engage any time, anywhere with the learning, more time on the task, and learner factors like enhanced motivation, greater authenticity of response and visible outcomes to help feedback. So Nick, uh, this is a small reminder to open the floor to questions. Uh, I just wanted to leave you as teachers with the idea, though, that it's all about teachers. It's not replacing teachers. Teachers simply need to consider their role differently and these are some of the issues I would focus on, including understanding better the role of assessment in learning. And this is my signature side of um, learning and assessment dancing hand in hand. We want a harmonious interaction between learning and assessment. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for that very, very interesting presentation, Nick. Um, and it was very, very lovely to see how you were talking about learning and assessment really being two sides of the same coin. So um, I'm, I'm hoping that a lot of teachers are able to take uh, that cue from your book and look at designing assessments uh, in that sense. And uh, what's also very, very, very wonderful, um, uh, you know, when we think about learning and assessments um, as, as being corollaries to one another, is that we also encourage in many ways um, student-led uh, assessments and how assessments can then act for students actually have ownership of um, what they are being assessed on, which is really, really crucial. Okay, so uh, thank you for that, Nick. Um, I'd now like to bring uh, our next speaker uh, on online. And uh, can I ask Spriti uh, from uh, DPS Cyberbath to talk to us a little bit about what she has been doing uh, for her classes and how she has been using assessments online. So over to you, Spriti. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Smriti Mutmeza, representing Delhi Public School, Cyberbad. Uh, Ma'am, can you start sharing the slides, please? Yes, Smriti, just doing that. Transacting and engaging the children online and then assessing them is a challenge for every teacher. And rightly said, when it comes to e-learning, content is everything. If content is not beautifully designed, everything will go down the drain. So now, Students become more fantastic to see the colorful backgrounds, colorful things. This is the medium to which I'm taking the online classes right now. What is a skill? My next slide, yeah. What is a skill? Skill is the ability or the proficiency develops for one's knowledge, practice, training, experiences, or aptitudes. And competencies are a cluster of skill, ability, knowledge, and attitude that enable a person to act effectively in the given situation. Yes, so when I talk about, for example, when I talk learning to design the carpentry is a skill, but able to drive a nail and cut the wood, it is a competency. For another example, so that for a better understanding is to be able to write a program is a skill but putting everything together is a competency 
for the competencies we need we need good analytical skills good problem solving skills to be able to solve a sum is a skill but when it comes to solve the problems of mental math it is a competency next slide next slide ma'am so to be able so these are the few uh, primary skills and on the basis of this we judge and assess pre primary and primary students to be able to communicate is a skill but when we focus on the communicate communication effectively grammatically well it should be articulated well it is a competency critical thinking is also a competency okay next slide please when we when we talk about so in our school the students did balancing activities and we assess them on the basis of the given rubrics good coordination good postural control and in this activity we covered gross motor skill next slide please so when we talk about the activities like including an activity making a lemonade be it sandwich making so we uh making in the curriculum these activities helps us to learn the students get to know about the healthy and the nutritive value children also learn about the soluble insoluble and the various reactions of the acid students of grade 2 and 3 did hemming activity i have shared the pictures also we can go ahead students of grade 2 and 3 next slide did the activities hemming and button swing activities so what is the competency that they use the competency used is the demonstration of knowledge but the teachers assessed them on the basis of the creativity on time completion it can be neatness it can be eye hand coordination skills covered in this activity is a critical thinking skill okay moving ahead competency based instructions are the learner centered it is a performance based these are the types of the white sheets that we have made to assess the various skill we design our rubrics and we maintain it and keep it as a record now i will be discussing about the integrated project okay so the ultimate aim of the education is to learn now now not for a year but for a lifetime we have designed few integrated projects in the lockdown so that the students can learn at home from the things which are available we have designed few topics and few subjects and we assess them on the basis of the given skills for example you can see in the table of the next slide that the topic for the grade 2 and 3 student is the seed germination when i'm talking about seed germination student will make a diagram of the plant showing all the parts of a plant so in td we can assess the child on the basis of the research skill when it comes to english writing a poem a simple poem it is a writing activity so in english we judge a child we judge a child on the basis of the writing skill moving ahead when it comes to calculations and using different pulses and the seeds what happened then in maths we are assessing in maths we are assessing the child on the basis of the number skills few assessment tools we are using for the primary students you can see in the table and the flow chart that is the language we judge a language that is listening reading speaking and writing on the basis and the tool we use is the oral language lab few more activities we have like we have mind spark we have brick math these activities helps to improve the skill in the mathematics fiction express is a beautiful platform that connects the students with the professional authors encourage their learning for the pleasure through the fun co creation of the stories in the fiction express we can also assess the child on on the basis of the uh on the basis of the quiz that they have performed now i will be discussing about the best pedagogical strategy is the self assessment yeah best pedagogical strategy is the self assessment we make the children responsible for his or her learning by making the child setting his or her own goals 
here you can see on the next slide you can see a picture you can see a table that we have shared with the students and they, they focus on the intrinsic goals action plan is made in order to achieve a particular goal what kind what kind of help is needed by a teacher and the parents to achieve that particular goal teacher sits like a guide and help the children to achieve the goals they are not a sage on the stage in the end i would like to say never stop learning because life never stops teaching thank you over to you pallavi ma'am thank you for that wonderful presentation smriti it was great to see some of those beautiful activities you've been doing with your student uh, students and also some interesting tools coming up like fiction express and uh, brick maths so uh, great tools to use with uh, with some of the younger tots as well uh, and these are uh, these are easier options for and less tech intensive as well uh, so something interesting for you to take home and try uh, with your own classes as well um, we'd now stop to take a couple of questions uh, some uh, have been coming up uh, over the last course, the last couple of speakers as well um, i'd like to start by asking if um, uh, if any and any of the panelists could take one of these up um, they wanted to know how we can actually assess students for subjective questions and how we can uh, um, give feedback for these uh, for subjective questions any ideas for that uh, panelists if anybody would like to share something that they've been doing already well i think um as it pertains to that in the longer answers um i've utilized google forms as a way to uh take that because i can give individualized feedback um and then the discussions that we have face to face via zoom and then we also have discussion posts as well um i think the point is to give students the structure to have um those types of conversations because talking and then writing and then typing are so are three different skills that students have to learn um and so uh utilizing those platforms has been helpful to me that's great thank you so much for that patrick uh and the next question um is about uh connecting um concepts of assessments as well as portfolios together and i know that um uh, ramanjeet is going to be talking about this uh, in just a little moment so if we can just put a hold to that question and we'll come to that right when you're you're starting and uh, i'd now like to go on and invite patrick to talk a little bit more about uh, the how he's been using some of these other interesting tools in his classroom and to take us through how he thinks about assessments as well so over to you patrick Thank you. How is everybody doing today? Um I am hoping that you have gotten some good rest. Um it is well, the sun is just rising here in America uh in the United States. So I am uh excited to be here with all of you. Uh I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'll be talking about summative uh assessments particularly from uh my experience. Uh the first question that I want to ask you is just who are you? Right? Who are you and what do you value? Because who you are and what you value directly impacts the types of assessments that you are going to create. and i think that when we're thinking about connecting and relating to students we have to think about who we are and what we bring to the table maybe the biases that we bring maybe the connections that we can make with students and so i'm a black american male teacher uh less than 2% of teachers in america are black american males and so i'm always thinking about that as i'm moving forward um I deeply value equity, justice and liberation for historically marginalized groups in education. There is a lot of unfairness happening, but I fundamentally believe that all kids, no matter where you come from, no matter where how you how you look or where you were born, that you have the right to a very excellent education. And so when I think about that and when I think about assessments, <clears throat> 
I have to acknowledge how assessments have been used to oppress historically marginalized people. Uh, it has been used to um, stop them from going to particular schools, labeling them, and so forth. And so I just want to start off my presentation with that fact. When you're thinking about assessments or learning opportunities, there, we, there are assignments, right? And the assignments that you do day to day, they're engaging, they're differentiated, they have multiple modalities. You're using video, you're playing, you're talking, you're writing, you're reading, right? But when we do summative assessments, it's usually one size fit all, right? You give an exam, a test on paper base or Google form is usually multiple choice or short answer. And I just want you to think what's wrong with this, right? How do we go from giving students so many ways of uh, assessing and exhibiting their knowledge to now having the one size fit all approach? That is to me inequitable and not fair to students. Um, so I'm always thinking about these when I'm designing uh, summative assessments. One is just like, what do my learning objectives look like in the workforce, right? How can I relate what we're doing to the real world? What do my students enjoy doing? How can I prepare them for this summative assessment? How can I utilize resources to push rigor and creativity? And then the most important question is, how can you ensure that all students have access to this assessment, right? Currently, I'm teaching 42 upper primary students, and some students are using laptops, some students are using Chromebooks, some students are, are using iPads, some students are using phones to do the work. That's not equitable, right? So when I'm designing assessments, I have to keep all that in mind to ensure that it's fair and that we're actually getting the knowledge. When we're talking about summative assessments, we wanna make sure that we are up here um, and so that students have a chance to really create, evaluate, and even analyze information. This is gonna give you the biggest bang for your buck up here. Um, ensuring that a summative assessments are fair, uh, these are just some quick tips. You wanna make sure that students know what's going on, what they're learning. Um, you wanna use different modalities. You can do that. I can show you uh, two examples after this. And then you wanna make sure that they're receiving feedback regularly so that when it's time for that test, that assessment, it's not scary, it's not high stakes because you have worked so hard to prepare them for that. Um, really quickly on rubrics, I don't want to take too much time here, but you want to make sure that your rubrics are not about following directions like this one is, you know, this is all about doing what the teacher says. And you want to make sure that it's about learning, right? And as much as you can, create rubrics with students so that they are aware of what they're doing and they can self-reflect throughout the process. Uh, this is a rubric that we created in upper primary for uh, a test that you'll see soon. So here's an example. I taught the uh, United States Constitution and Bill of Rights, right? Our learning targets were um, at the bottom below, but mainly about students analyzing problems to see how the Bill of Rights is used in action. Uh, before I gave them the summative assessment, we did the following. We read articles, we played games, we talked about uh, criteria for success, and we had discussions. Now, for the test, I could have just gave them just a Google form with multiple choice, right? But instead, I said, no, you're gonna take the role of lawyers today. You're gonna take the role of law students, and you're gonna listen to a client's case, and you're gonna tell them if the Bill of Rights has been broken, if their rights have been violated, right? So instead of just taking with their written response, I'm giving them multiple opportunities to show what they know. Uh, this is a funny photo here. This is me pretending to be a client, right? And we use Flipgrid and they listened to my problem and then they responded to that problem, um, letting me know if they could take me on as a client if I had a case. 
Um, the second example is I taught introduction to capitalism and poverty uh, for my upper primary students. And this was all about writing arguments and using domain specific vocabulary. Um, prior to the summative assessment, we also did a four week play based activity, um, which was all about store, uh, buying things and managing money. They analyzed a lot of hip hop music because in my culture, hip hop is is community um, and it's super important to us. Uh, is that Patrick, one uh, reminder to open the floor to questions. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and then uh, we also had a, a seminar as well. So instead of giving a test or just an essay, we created a rap song, right? And that rap song was then performed and they took all those skills and put it into that. That is still a summative assessment. It's still a summative assessment. Um, the songs can be found on YouTube. Uh, here are some of the lyrics that, or claims that came out of that. One that always um, stands out to me is getting so much money, this is a big opportunity and it's real funny. All I see is poverty. Can't you see any quality, right? Uh, my student is literally taking what he learned over the last couple of weeks and synthesize right? He, he's saying money is an opportunity, but even though you get money, there's still people without it, right? That's deep. I love it. I love it. I'm moving fast. Um, we want to get students to utilize as many creative resources as possible, particularly in the upper primary secondary sources, right? Sky is literally the limit here, but just because this new generation is so used to um, receiving so much technology and internet doesn't mean that they necessarily know how to use it. So we want to give them opportunities to increase their digital literacy, give them opportunities to increase their creativity. Here are some examples. Um, I utilize all of these. I'm still getting to know Fortnite. I'm sure I have some Fortnite fans in the house. Um, and, you know, that's just a a quick overview and uh, summary here. I would love to talk more. You can follow me uh, at President Pat on all things. And then I also host podcasts as well on education. Thank you. Thank you so much for that absolutely insightful presentation, Patrick. I think for a very, very long time, I'm going to remember the analogy that you gave about how um, assessments are actually, the, the impact, the social impact of assessments uh, goes way beyond the four walls of our classrooms into larger and more important questions around marginalization and discrimination. So thank you so much for raising that very, very important and crucial point. Um, equally relevant within the Indian context today as well. Um, taking a couple of questions before we move on to our next speaker. Um, there are some uh, teachers who actually wanted to find out how can we make sure that when we assign task online, that it's the student doing the task and not the parent. This is a particularly crucial problem at this point in time when kids are all working at home. So panelists opening this out to you, uh, what have you, what tips and tricks have you followed to, to make sure that's not happening? Yes. If I may come in here, Pallavi, so I think here the whole balance of the synchronous and the asynchronous learning will come into play. And I think what Dr. Nick said right at the very beginning, that at-home education. So we have to be very mindful when we're designing assessments. And there are so many ways, especially the formative checks that you're doing, that's happening like on the go. So you will always know where the child is in terms of his or her learning. And that way the learning and assessment is going to be integrated. So as teachers and as educators, we have to be mindful of that, that when we design, rather than the old things will not work. Giving a question paper or giving that kind of work is not going to work. So you'll have to go for the forms, you'll have to go, uh, uh, you know, in the synchronous way, you'll have to take it. So you'll have to come in that way. Yeah. Yes, Nick, go ahead. Well, I was just thinking that in the ecosystem of learning and you have children at home in, in the, or in, a, in their community, the, the people in that community become participants in the learning context, right? So they're there to scaffold or help the learner access the technology 
Forex access the information or to uh, engage in a task, right? So the, the parent uh, who does the task for the children assumes a task which is like a traditional exam, like a, uh, a multiple choice test. I'm not envisaging this in that way. I'm thinking that the learning task and the assessment of it are integrated so that the, it's the feedback from the observation of the task, which is done by the teacher, that creates the, um, the necessary learning in the next phase. Unfortunately, there is a lot of inequity. I mean, if you have a, a middle class mother in your home, then you will be you know, learning very rigidly according to the curriculum. If you don't, uh, many parents are not uh, well prepared to help learners. So I think uh, I would be less worried about the parents doing the, the task for the children and more interested in how we can enable, empower parents to become participants in setting up and uh, helping the children to engage in the task, including having the right technology, for example. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Nick. We are actually going to be building on that uh, topic as well in our next session where we talk about building parental involvement. And one other very crucial thing to note at this point in time is that if your student is receiving some input from the parents, that may not necessarily be a bad thing. The way in which we design our tasks should actually allow for that kind of learning to happen with the parent. But yeah. in a way where you're, you're allowing the parent to be more of a guide as opposed to uh, becoming the person who's taking charge of that model and actually making that model out of clay and so on and so forth. So on that note, uh, I'm going to now uh, hand over to Ramanjit to talk to us a little bit about including parental involvement, what has she and her school been doing for online assessments. Over to you, Ramanjit. Thank you so much, Pallavi, and good evening to everyone. I'm Ramanjit Ghuman from Oak Ridge International School, Mohali. We're a Nord Angli education school. And today I'm actually at this point going to stitch whatever we have been speaking about. So I'll start my presentation. And I really want to thank Fiki Arise and Hire for having me here and uh, Pallavi for this opportunity for facilitate, she's facilitated this entire thing. So here we go. So I'm going to talk about what Dr. Nick uh, started with, that assessments have to be ongoing. They're integrated along with learning, with learner being at the right, at the center. And yes, uh, we have already discussed this by the other panelists. This discussion has happened that as a teacher, what am I teaching? What are my learners learning? How do know, I know where they are? And then how do I take that data and improve my practice? And that's how assessment is ongoing. So this is the assessment cycle. And I think we have seen it today as well in a different form where we plan the learning outcomes, we pre-assess, we take that data, plan our learning engagements, get into a formative check, do scaffolding or differentiation, and then improve our practice and give feedback to the child so that the gaps are filled up and move forward. So now my focus today is going to be how it's happening in the classrooms in this new time when we are using the online platform. So I'm going to take specific examples. And the first one that I'm taking is Class Dojo. This is a platform. Uh, which primarily we are using for communication, but I want to take up the portfolio in it because uh, this links very well to the previous question that how do we bring in parents and how do we balance the synchronous and the asynchronous learning. So this is how Class Dojo looks like. And this is Mehtab. So Mehtab is in grade one. He's in Miss Negi's class. And mind you, he has just come to grade one around six weeks back from EYP2, he's never met his teacher. So uh, this is the, we're tracking the progress uh, over the period of six to seven weeks. And this is where parent as a learning partner comes in. So I think your conversations as a teacher, as a school with the parent and bringing them in as partners is so very important. So all the video that um, is here, the pictorial things are here, work samples are here, you can see, and they are dated. And this week when we go for the first three week conference and uh, we call it the annual expectation meet, that's when we will be uh, you know, projecting this through Google Hangouts and we'll be seeing where the child is and where we want Metab to be and track it. So it's a very powerful uh, you know, tool for 
portfolio. So, and feedback can be given. So you see here that teacher is giving the feedback and this will be discussed, of course. So here parent comes in beautifully as a partner because this is grade one, very, very young children. Now, the next thing that uh, uh, we are using is Jamboard, which is a Google G Suite whiteboard. And why kids love it is because it looks like this. So there are options of stickies and colors. Now here, uh, the teacher is assessing uh, with the ability to pose questions. So this is a grade two Jamboard where one child has asked, uh, posed a question that Scientists say it was Big Bang. So was it Big Bang or made by God or Earth was already there? I'm confused. So I think it gives the teacher a fair idea. And again, another exit ticket, which I feel is very uh, useful in this time because this is where the child just uh, you know, puts up the answer and exits a, a live meeting, especially for young children. So you know that as a teacher, you're exiting last, you have marked your attendance, and you know where your class is, and you can take this information to then improve your lesson and come back next day with a different plan if you need that to be. And I'm just going to tick quickly take you through this grade five uh, uh, topic on uh, social science we were doing on governments and levels of government and our skill focus was presentation skills we used padlet quizzes and flipgrid for this and uh, like patrick has spoken about co-created rubrics so we did this the teacher had a template she had a learning outcome but at this point of time this was step one it was with the teacher and uh, we went ahead and gave a padlet to the students and there were articles on what governments across the world have been doing for COVID. And the kids could, like the learners could identify that there's a set of people doing something. And yes, that the idea of government came out of that. And then of course the teaching learning happened and there was a pre-assessment through quizzes to check how each child is doing, where each child is. And that's the power of this online that you can really make it personalized if you use the data that you know comes out of it. And of course, then there were presentations, discussions, so many classwork, homework, other assignment tasks, and we reached the stage where we wanted to do the formative check and we used Flipgrid. So through Flipgrid, children could create these lovely videos. I can just try to play one if I am able to, otherwise it's there on the Padlet. If the system allows, if my network allows, I can just about like take you through one if I can. And the children could give feedback to each other. The teacher could give feedback to, I think it's taking a little time, so I'll not go into it. My system is not supporting. So you can have a look at it. It's going to be on the Padlet. You can see this. And the teacher could give feedback. Children could give feedback to each other. And there was a lot of learning that happened. And before this task was assigned, we discussed the rubrics in detail with the children and they were co-created. So the teacher came with a fair idea, but it was firmed up before the task was assigned and it got co-created. And mind you, in our school, red uh, stands for advanced. So once the task was done, then the teacher, uh, she uh, gave this feedback individually to the students and she took that feedback as well. And we found out that our children needed to read more. So. That's what more articles were shared with the children and materials to so deepen their understanding. So this is how the complete cycle was used for a formative check. Going forward, um, we've been talking about Google Forms. Our children have used Google Forms, of course, for subjective assessment and giving feedback. And we've also used Google Slides. Again, a specific example just to illustrate it. So, um, in a regular brick and mortar school, when they do body systems, and if we had wanted to do this health card, children would have created this beautiful health cards and they would have gone around the school community doing health checks for everybody. But now, we, because we are just at home, so we used Google Forms where the teacher can actually Google Slides, where the teacher can uh, you know, look at the work that's happening. And the children have done this for the parents it was so interesting to note that uh, this child has written that hygiene, of course, plays an important part to keep us safe during the COVID time. And for the red is advanced, like I told you, so for the gadgets, for so we can come to know through this formative check that how effectively have we got the learning across to the child. And then we can, of course, course correct if needed. 
and most important, like we have been talking through the evening, that giving feedback is so important. So post this engagement, the teacher has a single point rubric where she fills it in for each child and that then is taken forward to better her practice. So just to do a little quick recap, here are quite a few things that I've talked about and strategies, but main thing is the design. So when we are designing, we have to keep the learner at the heart. We have to ensure that it's ongoing and it's just not just random. It has to post correct all the time. So you have to stay on it and uh, happy learning to all of you. Thank you so much. This is all from me. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Ramanjit. It was great to see some of the amazing work that your students have been doing, particularly those portfolios and class dojo. They were absolutely wonderful to see uh, how students have been responding to that. And class dojo, for those of you um, who are not familiar with the tool, also allows you to actually pack in lots of classroom behavior um, uh, ups as well. You can actually motivate students um, and give them uh, badges on dojo uh, for good classroom behavior uh, and so and, and other uh, you know motivating uh, factors as well so class social is a great app to use any which way uh, thank you for that Ramanjit and uh, before I move on to our uh, next speaker um, I'd like to very quickly um, take a couple of more questions and uh, uh, one question that has come up uh, Patrick this one is specifically for you uh, somebody is wanting to know how did you get those subtitles to come up at the bottom of your screen uh, some of them would like to do that for their own videos so could you please tell them how you were able to do that as well yes yeah, so um, this is a Microsoft PowerPoint feature um, I can I wish I could say I can walk you through it but it literally just popped up so I'm sure if you go to Microsoft PowerPoint and you go to the search icon in the uh, upper right hand corner you should be able to uh, uh, type in subtitles and it'll talk as you speak or write it as you speak okay thank you so much for that uh, Patrick we also have a question on um, uh, on project-based learning uh, and if those of you who are doing project-based learning in your schools um, should project-based learning um, how is it that we can conduct some kind of an online interview or uh, an assessment of um, the students and you know progress or uh, tracking learning online what are some of the things that uh, any of you have been doing in your own classrooms uh, to measure that to measure group Um, if I may come in here and then maybe if anybody else wants to answer that, I think uh, most of the tools that I spoke about today allow that. So all these tools can be used in a combination. So we cannot go with, it's the design that's very important that when we are designing the project and uh, at various phases, you can use different things. So I, I won't go with very one prescribed tool, but yes, I think a combination of things will help. So children could like, I think Patrick showed that uh, there was a lyric, the, the lyrics were put to music. So that could also be a part of it. So a lot of things can be done. That's great, wonderful. So thank you panelists for these amazing ideas today for your own take on assessments and to see how you've been using assessments in this digital environment has been really, really inspiring. So thank you for all your great ideas and for uh, giving us your time today. Uh, I'd like to now uh, hand this back over to uh, Mr. Jaipuria to close today's webinar. Uh, Mr. Jepuria, sir, you're on mute. I'm sorry. Thank you so much, Pallavi. The session was extremely engaging and gave us a very deep understanding and insights about assessment. I would like to particularly thank our eminent speakers, Smriti, Ramanjit, Nick, and Patrick for sharing their best practices. We all know that schools might have to be to go for blended classrooms and blended learning when they reopen in order to maintain social distancing. Assessment is an area which most of the practitioners are struggling with. Today's presentations give us an opportunity 
to apply concepts of design thinking in all areas of assessment so that we come up with innovative solutions and break away from the fixed way of thinking we must now see assessment as a learning in itself and also as a tool for learning as well as of learning i am confident that the pandemic has given an opportunity to the whole teaching community to rethink our potential and to ensure that we are positioning ourselves for the future thank you thank you so much everybody for joining us today and have a lovely evening ahead thank you bye bye